Well, good morning, church, and here we are again, hopefully for one of the, the last times of just being able to, to do this via the internet without anybody here. And so if you hadn't gotten the email or if you hadn't heard from our previous messages right now, we're tentatively looking at May 24th as being our first Sunday uh, to meet here in person again. And as long as things continue to trend in the right direction, that's what we will will go by. But as we have from the beginning, we will heed the, the warnings of the governor and, and the askings of the state in order to best protect those around us. I know it's frustrating. It's not always easy, uh, but we want to stick by those things to do as best we can to keep everybody safe. But right now we are still looking at that May 24th as an opening date. And we're excited and looking forward to that, have the ability to come back and meet together. And don't forget, if we have that May 24th opening, then we want to try to have a church fellowship meal that day. So begin thinking about that and prepping for that as well. Uh, just a time for us to come back to celebrate together. And quickly, just want to rem remind you that when you're watching this, that that day between 2 and 4, Linda Kate will be here on the 3rd of May for the drive through baby shower for Vince and Rachel Granado. So we encourage you to bring your gifts by. Or if you're not able to come at that time, just reach out to us, let us know so we can make sure we get those and get those gifts over to them and so we can shower this new baby come in and be excited along with them. So with those couple of things in mind and cover those, we'll cover them again at the end as well. Let's jump into our lesson this week as we look at Habakkuk, continuing in there, this Habakkuk, a very short book of the Old Testament. And we want to look just a little bit, uh, a little bit about what we were at last week when we started Habakkuk, this first prayer of Habakkuk last week, uh, when he's talking about the injustice of these Babylonians or Chaldeans being the ones coming to bring judgment, how they were so unworthy and they were all these things wrong with them and, and this, that, and the other, and and how they shouldn't be allowed to do this, and, and God's tolerating their wrongdoing, and he's just sort of whining about the whole situation, if you remember what we talked about last week, and God sort of answers him saying, I know exactly who they are, I know exactly what they're doing, but I'm using them to accomplish my purpose. And basically what he was trying to do was show the Israelites that they needed to get back towards him, right? To please get back to him, uh, because if they're not going to, then he's going to use these other people to get them back in line. And the idea being that God is going to work towards the front of his people, and if we don't put him at the front, he's going to get there one way or the other. We've all, or most of us have had moments in our lives where we have gotten sideways or out of sync with God, and he does something to draw us back into right relationship with him. And sometimes it's just him letting us know or, or weighing on our conscience, telling us that we need to get back with him, and that's enough. And there's other times where God sort of has to use the stick, right? It's the carrot and stick idea here. Sometimes the carrot works, other times the stick works, uh, but we shouldn't want the stick. We shouldn't get to the point that we need the stick. And the Israelites to this point had gotten to the point where the stick was necessary. And obviously when the stick became necessary, we see Habakkuk and I'm sure others were complaining about this. Why are we being punished? Why is this going on? And we're going to see Habakkuk say something today inside of his second prayer uh, that will sound very familiar to a lot of us. And so with that in mind, we pick up here at Habakkuk Chapter 1, verse 12 says this, Are you not from eternity, Yahweh my God, my Holy One? You will not die. Lord, you appointed them to execute judgment. My rock, you destined them to punish us. And so we see Habakkuk here sort of talking, sort of answering to what God said at the beginning of last week in verse 12, sort of saying, you know, yes, God, you're eternal. You'll not die. You've appointed them to execute judgment. Uh, my rock, you destined them to punish us. So Habakkuk here sort of seeing what God was saying here, that God was using the, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, in order to accomplish a purpose. And he's sort of agreeing, not much, so much agreeing, but understanding that's what's happening now, Habakkuk is. So then in 13, we see this, your eyes are too pure to look upon evil, so you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? And we just pause right there for a minute at 13 and realize sort of the boldness of Habakkuk right here and what he's saying to God, because you know basically what he's doing is he's, he's trying to blackmail a little bit here. He's trying to sort of make God out to, to be not who he said he was. Because what he's telling God here, you know, you think at the beginning of 13, that his eyes are too pure to look upon evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. But then he follows that up with, why are you silent while one who is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? Which, what is he saying there? Well, what he's saying is, God, why are you using this horrible nation of Babylonia, of, of the Chaldeans, why are you using them to swallow up us, Israel, who's not as bad as them? Right? 
And, and you think about that, that should sound pretty familiar because we do that a lot today, right? Like I may be bad, but I'm not as bad as that guy over there, right? We've talked about this here at church before. It's the, the Hitler mentality, right? I may be bad or I may do things that are wrong, but I'm not on the level of Hitler or Stalin or these world's great dictators, which how evil are we that that becomes the bar? How bad are we that the bar becomes, oh, I'm bad, but I'm not this level bad. Right. And so we see here and that's kind of what Habakkuk's doing. He's saying, God, why are you silent when this wicked nation swallows up us who really aren't that bad? So what's Habakkuk really saying here? Well, Habakkuk is sort of saying. My wickedness isn't as bad as everybody else's wickedness or our wickedness as a nation isn't as bad as everybody else's wickedness. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is, is he's still comparing himself. He's still comparing the nation of Israel to everyone else around them when the measuring stick is not the other ones around you. Our measuring stick is God. Our measuring stick is Jesus Christ, which if we're trying to compare righteousness between us and them, we lose 100 percent of the time. It's not even a fair comparison. Which is why Habakkuk here goes to the idea of the nations being unequal. Habakkuk is smart enough to know he can't compare Israel and himself and these people to God because they'll lose. But if he can get them lined up with the other nations around them, well then there should be enough good to come out on Israel's side. Right? As bad as they've been, as far as they've gotten away from God, at least they still recognize him. The Babylonians, the Chaldeans at this point, don't even recognize God as God. And so that's what Habakkuk sort of hanging his hat on, this idea of being, at, well, at least we know who you are. At least we have somewhat of a relationship with you. These other folks, they don't have nothing. And so what Habakkuk's doing here is he's scrambling, right? He's scared. He's nervous about what he's seeing in his country. So he's scrambling for God to do something other than what he's getting ready to do, which is conquer Israel. He's reaching, which all of us in that situation, I think, would. So we see in 14, it says this, you have made mankind like the fish of the sea, like marine creatures that have no ruler. The Chaldeans pull them all up with a hook, catch them in their dragnet and gather them in their fishing net. That is why they are glad and rejoice. That is why they sacrifice to their dragnet and burn incense to their fishing net. What he's talking about here is the army. The Babylonians were known for their army and it was this wide and sweeping conquering force that would come in and just by sheer numbers, would overrun places. And that was their strength. We talked about that last week. If you remember at the end of last week's sermon at verse 11, God says it. They are guilty. Their strength is their God. That the Chaldeans were so hung up on their power as a military might, that's what they caught their focus in. That's what they thought was their strength. Which, if that doesn't sound a little familiar to us today as 2020 Americans, reevaluate what we think as a country. Because we have to be careful, church, today. Because as much as I love being an American, as much as I love the country that I live in, my strength cannot be in that. I cannot find myself being so hung up on the might of our military, which it is. There has never been a military like the United States military in the history of the world. But in comparison to the strength of Jesus Christ, comparison in the strength of God, the United States military is nothing. And that's not me trying to say anything negative about our military. Those folks that serve, that have served and continue to serve, you are some of the bravest and, and I appreciate you more than you will ever understand. But if I find my strength in the military, I will be left wanting. Because my strength has to come from the Lord. Because my strength has to come from the one who is eternal. Right? The United States military is not eternal. It has not been forever. And it will not be forever. My strength must come from the Lord. Just as the Babylonian strength came from their army. Folks, the Babylonians, that army doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. It was not eternal. As much as they would have liked it to have been. As much as we love our country and think about how awesome it is, it will not last forever. In relative thought process of, our, of what nations are and how long they are, America is an infant we have not been around that long and it will not last forever. We've read Revelation. We know that eventually this whole thing's going to go away. So to think that this country will last forever is a falsehood. 
We look at this with the Babylonians, it's the same thing. Their strength was their army, but yet their strength was failing because it wasn't going to last forever. And so then we look at the end of 16 here where it says this, For by, their, by these things their portion is rich and their food plentiful. As the Babylonians would go, they would conquer. Obviously, as they conquered, they got the spoils of war. They got to take from the food stocks and all of the things that these other nations had. So then we see in 17, will they therefore empty their nets and continually slaughter nations without mercy? And so we see here what, what's Habakkuk saying? Well, he's saying toward the end here that are they going to be allowed just to go pilfer everybody else? Are they going to be allowed to go and conquer and take and take and take without mercy? That they go and they conquer and they slaughter and they take and they offer mercy to no one. And Habakkuk here sort of looking at the fact that that's contradictory towards what God would say, right? We've talked about this here, church, what I, what I believe to be the two greatest attributes of Jesus Christ, therefore also the two greatest attributes of God, grace and mercy. And the Babylonians, the Chaldeans at this point, offer none of those to anybody. There's no grace. And there's no mercy. And so Habakkuk here sort of looking at these things saying, these people are anti-everything you stand for, God. That God, if you are good and merciful, they are evil and unmerciful. Yet you're using them to conquer us who are your chosen people. So you could see where Habakkuk would probably be a little bit of, a little confused about what's going on here. And then we get to the beginning of chapter 2 here where Habakkuk says this. I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should do about my complaint. Habakkuk basically says, I've said what I've said, and I'm going to stand here and wait until God gives me an answer. Part of me looks at that with Habakkuk and goes, that is awesome. That is such boldness to say, this is where I'll stand, and when God's ready, he's going to answer me. The other part of me is going, that's foolish, Habakkuk, because you have mouthed off to the one you ought not mouth off to, and this response may not be what you want to hear. But Habakkuk stands firm, says that he will wait for the response. And then it comes quick. We see at the beginning of chapter two, verse two, it says this. Then the Lord answered me. Write down this vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. Which if we go back and look at this in the original language, uh, part of the translation is a little bit lost here in our English because we get it as it may be easily read or it can be easily readable. Uh, we go back and look at it and some of the original language says that it could be read by those who run, i.e. write it down so big that as you are running for your life, you'll be able to read it without stopping. So write down this message so large that no matter what you're doing, you're going to be able to read it, whether you're walking out of here or running for your life, right? You think about that as, well, what does that really look like today? Well, think about it, church. You've ever been on the highway going 75 because that's the speed limit, right? Right? You've been on the highway going whatever speed you deem to be the speed limit at the time, yet you can still clearly read all of those billboards on the side of the road telling you which McDonald's is at what exit or what Whataburger or what you're looking for. You can clearly read those signs and you sometimes get, there's this false idea that, oh, those signs aren't really that big. No, they're massive if you ever really get up on them. These things are huge for us to be able to see them from the comfort of our vehicles going at our appropriate speed on the highway. They are massive. Uh, some other things that we don't think about like that are like traffic lights, how big a traffic light really is. And that's what God's saying here. God's saying, write this down so that no matter how fast you're moving or where you're at, you'll be able to read it and read it easily. So basically what God is saying here to Habakkuk is, shut your mouth and listen for a minute. And if you're Habakkuk, you're getting scared. And I think in our own lives, God has these moments with us as well where God sort of looks at us like a parent would and says, the time for your talking is over. It is now time to listen. And that's what is happening right here. God is telling him it is time for listening. And not just listening, but hearing me, right? Because you can listen to somebody and not hear them. What God is saying here is you're not just going to listen. You're going to hear this. And you're going to understand it because this, this is important. 
And so we see this in three. It says, for the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and it will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity. Now, these are little H's here. So he's talking about humanity, talking about Habakkuk or talking about the Babylonians. But the righteous one will live by his faith. We think about that for a minute, that the righteous one will live by his faith. Well, what does that look like? Well, in this time, it looks like those that would still stand alongside what's going on and say, I trust what God's doing. I trust that in the midst of us being overrun and conquered by these Babylonians, that God is good, that God is enough. We think about that today, church. What does that look like for us today? Well, in the midst of everything we see going on around us, that we would still say, God is faithful. God is merciful. God is good. God is righteous. Because there's a lot of people out there, folks, that are, that are blaming God for this, that are saying God doesn't love or God isn't understanding, and that is not the case at all. As I've said from the beginning, I don't believe that God caused this, but I believe he's allowing it to happen. And I believe he is still just as merciful, still just as righteous as he was before this. That God is still offering grace and mercy to those who would ask. Salvation isn't lost at this point, folks. You could still be saved. God is still there. God is still willing to welcome you as a believer. It says the righteous will live by his faith. That today we will live as believers by our faith. That we will trust that God is doing what he's called us to do. And that's a big ask, folks, because as we think about what the Bible says about Scripture, or what Scripture says about how our lives are supposed to be, we are supposed to be those who follow under the governors and the leaders put over us. That even though we may not agree and we may not like it, that we would understand that God has allowed these people to be in a position for a reason, and that we should listen. Church, that nothing would make me happier than to throw these doors open and bring you all back here tomorrow that's what I want but as a believer I'm called to listen to the authorities put over me and right now they're telling me that's not smart that's not safe and they're asking me to wait a little longer and that's what we're doing it's not easy but I have to trust that if God tells me to do that then that's good And that's what I have to live by. I have to live by my faith in my God. Because scripture tells me he alone is good. and He alone is enough. So then we see in five, it says this, Moreover, wine betrays. An arrogant man is never at rest. He enlarges his appetite like shoal. And like death, he is never satisfied. He gathers all the nations to himself. He collects all the people's for himself. We think about the arrogant. The arrogant man is never at rest. Those who constantly seek for more and more and more. That's why we see in Timothy that the love of money is the root of all evil. That we're told as believers, this is not about us. We should not seek out more for ourselves. It's not about building a place where we can come and pat ourselves on the back about how great we are. That's why I hurt sometimes when I hear Christ followers tell me, oh, well, my church runs 5,000 people. Great. How many people are getting saved? How many people are going out and accomplishing the work of the gospel? How many of those 5,000 people are getting together as believers and loving on one another? How many of those 5,000 people see a visitor come in and love on that visitor so they feel welcomed and able to come back? The church isn't about the number. This place is not about us. Our hope, our our trust should not be in how big our building gets and how many people show up or, or this, that, or the other. What we should worry about is, are we living by faith? Are we seeking out after Jesus Christ? Am I seeking out after Jesus Christ? Are you seeking out after Jesus Christ in everything that you do? Because that's what matters. 
And that's what Israel had lost sight of here. Israel had lost sight of seeking out after God and everything that they were doing. And now they were reaping the reward that they had brought on themselves. And church, if we're not very careful, we will fall into this same trap today and we will begin to seek out things that are not of God on a daily basis and we will reap the reward that comes from that, which is death. We will reap the rewards that come from our unrighteousness. Or we will do what we were called to do by faith which is to trust and seek out after the Lord Jesus Christ, to become more like him and less like the world. And then we're told our reward waits for us in eternity, where we would stand before a holy God and hear, welcome, good and faithful servant, I prepare a place for you. Come and take your rest. And church rest sounds funny right now because I know a lot of you are at home and you're getting a lot of rest, probably more than you want. When we think about that rest in eternity with the creator of the universe is rest that we can't understand until we get there. Church, my hope is that everybody's doing well. My hope is that you are having your needs met and that you're reaching out to your neighbors and your loved ones and making sure their needs are met as well. Church, I challenge you in this time as, as we're so close to being able to meet together again to understand that that's our hope. But we're going to be smart and we're going to do what we're called to do and asked to do by the leadership put over us. Church, let's pray. God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the ability to still gather together, albeit differently. God, we thank you for the protections you've offered us. We thank you for the safety you've given us. God, we pray that you would continue to meet the needs of those in our community, those around us, that you would make sure bellies are full and, and people are protected. God, we pray for those afflicted with this virus that you would provide protection. God, for those workers, those doctors, those nurses, our frontline workers, our grocery store workers, our truck drivers, God, that you would protect them, provide strength. God, as we're beginning to see the reopening of our state and our country, we pray that this would go well, uh, that things would, would, would open in such a way that we could get back to, to having things open and being able to move around a little bit more freely. But God, moreover, we pray that folks would come to know you through this that those that have not yet accepted you would see you in this and trust in you in this and understand that you are still good, that you are holy, that you alone are good for salvation. They may come to know you through this, to join you as a believer, to become a child of God. And we thank you for the gifts and the abilities you give us on a daily basis. I pray for the community of believers that would watch this video, that we would seek to serve you and not the world. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, we're looking forward to the time that we can gather together again in person. Remember the few announcements we had at the beginning of this message. Uh, number one, May 24th, hopefully we'll be able to meet together again in person. Uh, that is what we are looking forward to. Also remember the drive through baby shower for Vince and Rachel Granado. May 3rd, 2 to 4, Linda Kate will be here. You can come drop those gifts off. If you can't make it on that day, that's okay. Uh, just let us know so we can find a time uh, to get up here and get you in the building and get your stuff dropped off. Church, if nothing else, remember these things. We love you. There's absolutely nothing you can do about that. Stay safe. We'll see you soon.